Good morning, church. Welcome to the church at Whistling Pines. My name is Sean McCracken. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are so grateful that you're with us and that you're watching online. We are going to have two baptisms today. Woo! So your job is to lose your mind and to celebrate because when, when, we, when we are water baptized in front of the church, we are doing so to celebrate. It is the outward sign of the inward work that, that Christ is doing in our lives. And we do it outwardly so that we show what God is doing in our lives and that we are his. And so you lose your mind here and at home you lose your mind too. And so if somebody in your house isn't watching, they will ask what is going on. And so you can tell them that somebody just got baptized. So Ricky Langley is going to be baptized and his family's here. And so that's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. Pablo's here too, or as I like to call him Bubba, because I, I didn't hear correctly and I thought they said Bubba, you know, because Pablo and Bubba sound so much alike. Um, and, and yeah, yeah. And also, also Lee Parker is getting baptized this morning too. So we're super excited about both of them. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter 16. We're continuing our series, um, the, the Chronological Parables of Jesus, and we are on number 24. There's only 32, so we're almost to the end. Hopefully you are taking time <clears throat> during the week to, to watch the mini bites. If not, you're missing some of them. So uh, today we're going to look at a very interesting one. And that is the rich man and Lazarus. So Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. What we're going to do is read it through and then we're going to discuss it. So Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19. Jesus says, there was a rich man. Let me get my spectacles. Don't laugh at me. I look smarter too. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar. So when, when Jesus tells a parable, it helps. It certainly helps me. I think it would help you if you tried to picture this, okay? Because a parable is all about word pictures. So picture somebody rich, dressed in fine linen and purple. Purple meant royalty. So this dude, if he wasn't royalty, he certainly was dressed like royalty. And so he was rich, and there was this beggar laying at his gate, okay? At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels came and carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, And send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides, all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Verse 27, he answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. 
Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Verse 31, he said to them, to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Okay, so this parable is under debate and has been for many centuries whether it is a parable or not. The reason is there's some similar similarities and some, some things that are different about it. So let's go over the similarities first of all. We just read it and we've been going over all of Jesus' parables and so you'll notice that the similarities about it is it begins just like all of Jesus' parables and it sounds very much like all of Jesus' parables. His points are very similar to his other parables. It's different because he's making a different point and things like that. But his, his wording and all of these kind of things are very much like his other parables. He's telling a story. That's what a parable is. is is a, a uh, elongated um, simile, if you will. And so in that way, it's very similar to other parables. The difference is that it has named characters. It's the only parable of all of Jesus's that has named characters. And that's the reason why some people feel like it's not indeed a parable, but instead something that has really happened. The issue with that that most people have, and most people put it in the camp of a parable, and I'm one of them that puts it in the camp of a parable is that it still is is um, of the uh, the literary camp of a parable it sounds like a parable he's the his his uh, his point of view is a, is like a parable it's a metaphor like a parable he's trying to get across a point like he does in a parable he's not giving a um, a history lesson like he would in in other writings he is very much telling a story the difference is he's naming names instead of a certain man went off and uh, appointed a landowner to do this or that like he does in other parables so if that's the case we have to determine why is he naming names but before we do that one of the major things about this parable is it talks about eternity and so we are tempted to think that this parable is about eternity sorry we'll get to the eternity in a minute let's talk about the characters <laughs> so the first one is the rich man he's not named so why does he name other people but he doesn't name the rich man I believe that it's because he's consumed with his wealth his power and his comfort and he doesn't need a name he's nameless because what's most important is his wealth he's he's uh, he's articulated in the point of what he's wearing and what he's doing he's he's shunning the poor man he's he's so consumed with what he's wearing and what he's eating and what he's doing to the poor man that he doesn't need a name his name is his wealth his name is wealthy man or rich man. Then we have the character of Lazarus. Why is he named instead of just poor man? He could have been rich man and poor man. Lazarus actually means whom God helps in the Greek. And so maybe if you were a Greek speaker, you would maybe instantly recognize what Lazarus meant more than you and I as English speakers would. Perhaps the original intended listeners heard Lazarus and instantly understood that that meant whom God helps. Maybe Jesus naming him as Lazarus, they understood, oh, this isn't just any poor man. This is a poor man whom God helps. Somebody that is pointed out as, yes, he's poor. Yes, he's got boils or sores or, or whatever his malady was, and he's poor and he's begging but it's somebody that's, that's distinguished as, 
Yes, this man that isn't feeding him is, is rich, but this is somebody that God is looking after. And he is um, distinguished apart from him as this one, his money helps. This one, God helps. And so perhaps the reason that Jesus uses a name for him is that Jesus wanted to point out that God helps this poor man. He's not just any poor man, but he's somebody that God helps. Then we have Abraham, who is clearly named because he's the father of the faith. When he's brought to Abraham's side, it's for a reason. He's brought to heaven, as we see in this eternity thing that we're going to look at in just a moment, because it's the father of the faith. Any Jew would understand Abraham very clearly, and we're going to get to that, as the father of the faith. And then we see Moses and the prophets listed by name for a distinguished purpose. Moses and the prophets was shorthand basically for the Old Testament. Uh, Moses would be the, um, the Pentateuch or the first five books or the law, and the prophets would be the, the prophetic writings or Uh, shorthand for the rest of scripture so what he's saying is the old testament or god's word so i believe this is why this particular parable was different than just a particular man or a certain man went off to to war and gave his vineyard to somebody else is why they're listed by name but we don't really know for sure why jesus chose this parable only to give names okay now it it does talk about eternity but again i don't believe this is the only reason jesus gave this parable i believe he has another main purpose or a couple of main purposes for giving this parable however we must see that eternity as we just read is a main dialogue or main points in in his parable so eternity we see that the the poor man or Lazarus was taken to Abraham's side or the the King James and the New American Standard Version among others say Abraham's bosom what does that mean we're tempted to maybe think that this is like a, a separate wing or or branch of heaven it's not that or, or maybe it's like purgatory like the Catholics believe that it's like this holding area or or cell or whatever before you get to heaven it's not that it's really glorious if we understand really what it means what it really means is a seating area at a banquet in heaven remember in in um uh when when jesus is having the last supper with his disciples and the disciple whom Jesus loved, which would be John, is leaning up against Jesus' bosom. It's the same wording, same Greek word. And this is during the feast, uh, a a foreshadowing of of the the heavenly feast. And that's why we have communion together as a foreshadow of the, the, what Christ did for us, or a shadow of what Jesus did for us, and a foreshadow of the heavenly feast That we're going to have together so here is Lazarus a man full of sores and poor that can't even have the crumbs off of the table when he dies is taken up to the greatest seat of the faith the father of the faith Abraham remember this is before Jesus was crucified and died so it's not talking about at Christ's right side which wouldn't be reserved for him anyway but to the, to the side of faith because of his great faith. So this, this place of honor, if you will, he had dishonor on earth, but in heaven, he's got this great place of honor at a place of a feast. He, he wasn't allowed to eat on earth, and in heaven, he's not only allowed to eat, but he's at a feast on the, on the right side of Abraham, leaning up against his bosom, or at least certainly on his side of Abraham. That's what this means. So that's one part of eternity that it talks about. 
The other part is hell, of course. And it talks about where there's agony and torment. Now, it doesn't go into great detail other than that. Certainly, this is one part in the New Testament that talks about hell, that gives us a glimpse of what hell looks like. We also have much greater detail and glimpses in the book of Revelation as well as elsewhere. But again, Jesus' main point is not to give us some sort of an idea of what heaven and hell is going to look like or what it's going to smell like or what it's going to feel like or any of that. That's not his main concern with this parable. It's just part of the description. It's part of the character development, if you will, of his parable. So let's read it again, and then we'll talk about what is he teaching. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus, again, which means God who helps, by his side. Verse 24. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the, fing- the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Now just imagine the audacity of this man. He's now in hell in agony. He, Lazarus in, on earth was begging for crumbs. And now the rich man is in hell and now he's the beggar. The roles have reversed. And he's begging Father Abraham to send the beggar, Lazarus, down to dip his, the tip of his finger in water to, to quench his thirst. Not send someone. Not send a slave, a lackey, someone. But send Lazarus. Are you picking up on that? Like, he still considers Lazarus less than. Even now that he's in hell, and again, this is why it's a parable, because we clearly see that he's saying there's a chasm between us. If there's a chasm between us, you can't see between it either. So this is a parable. There's this imagery, this story that Jesus is telling But in this story that Jesus is telling, this idea of this man, this rich man, this figurative rich man, his understanding of who he is and who this poor beggar is, Lazarus, whom God helps, is still beneath him. Verse 25, but Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them. Seems like now all of a sudden he has compassion, at least for his family. Let them not suffer the consequences that I have, so that they will not also come to the place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they have people, 
They have, not just in their lifetime, they had Moses and the prophets, but they have the holy word of God. They have God's word. Let them listen to them or it. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Verse 31, Jesus is talking about it wouldn't do any good if Lazarus rose from the dead and went to them. But in so doing, he's prophesying. It's not going to do any good when I rise from the dead. People will still not listen to me. So what does this teach? First of all, does this teach that the poor go to hell, or go to heaven rather, and the rich go to hell? Yes, so give me your money. No, no, absolutely not. Can we take up an offering? I mean, if this doesn't preach about tithing, Robert, right, Pastor Robert, nothing else will. No, of course not, this does not teach this. So first of all, um, the Lazarus, the, the poor man, was taken to Abraham's side, right? And so that means Abraham's in heaven, which we would imagine he is. He's the father of the faith. Abraham was one of the richest men who have ever lived, who have ever walked this, the face of this earth. And so he's in heaven. So that's number one. Number two, if the poor go to heaven and the rich go to hell, that would mean our eternal security, one way or the other, is based on our works. It's based on something we could earn. And that's false. It's based on grace and grace alone. It's based on what Jesus Christ does for us. So that is false. This parable is not teaching that. However, Jesus did teach that it's really difficult for a rich man to go to heaven. He said this in Matthew 19, 23 through 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, whether that means there was an actual uh, column called the eye of a needle and it was very difficult for a camel to pass through, you had to take a lot of the luggage and stuff off of a camel to go through it, it's been said, or it's really what most of us imagine, an actual camel going through the eye of a little needle, Regardless of how we look at that scripture, the point is still clear. It's very difficult for a rich man to enter kingdom, into the kingdom of God. Why? He just doesn't like rich people? They're snooty? He doesn't like the smell of money? No, it's not that at all. It's a rich person. There's something about us when we have money or we have power or we have anything we tend to rely on that and not on God. Remember Lazarus' name. He depends on God. We, we take our source of security from God and not on riches. The rich man just depended on, God, uh, depended on his riches and not on God. So that's why it's difficult. It has nothing to do with he doesn't want to bless us. You can be rich as Abraham was and as other rich men were in Scripture and still find yourself in heaven and still find yourself blessed. There is a spiritual gift of, of being um, financially blessed so that you can bless others. He wants to open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessings that we cannot receive so that we can bless others. The problem is, is when we rely on it. So it's not teaching that. Is it teaching godly communication with the dead? And I put godly instead of just communication with the dead because there is a demonic world. I believe that there, there is a possibility of communicating with the dead in a, in a uh, demonic sense. But is this, is this teaching that we can communicate 
with people who have passed on. Like both of my parents have passed on. Does that mean that I can speak to them? I can go to a seance and speak to them and, and I'm, I'm a Christian and, and, and I believe in God and, and, and in a godly way, maybe they have a message for me. Is this parable teaching that? Absolutely not. It's not teaching that at all. In fact, it says there's a chasm. There's a, there's a divider. They can't get to us and we can't get to them. Even if they wanted to, it says. Even if we wanted to. There's a chasm. That's why Jesus says, that, that Father Abraham says in this parable, that we have Moses and the prophets. We have Holy Scripture. We have the gospel now in the New Testament that teaches us what we need to know. We don't need the dead to come back. We don't need somebody in hell to tell us how horrible it is. There's this fad of the last several decades of people to write stories about they went down to hell and came back and, and they write books. I'm not saying if it's real or not. I don't know, but I don't see scripture to back it up. This parable isn't backing it up. That's not what this parable is about. That's not what Jesus is teaching. So we have to be careful about that. The problem isn't with the message, it's with the audience. So when he's saying there's this chasm, it's not that there's a problem with the message and so he had to just shut it off. He's like, oh man, it wasn't working out. So, you know, at, at one time it was working where the dead, you know, had a free way to come back and, and speak and then it was like, oh, whoa, hey, we, we had the, you know, freedom of speech was going haywire. I mean, man... They were saying some wacky stuff, man, and we had to cut it off. It wasn't that at all. The problem was the, the audience. We had hard hearts. The chasm, the reason for the fixed chasm is very clear in this parable and throughout Scripture. It's fixed by the justice of God. That's why he sent his son, Jesus. That's the only way to get to God. It's not through message from the dead. So it clearly does not mean that any dead can can speak to us it's another reason that i think it's clearly a parable it's a story he was trying to get to a point every detail does not mean that it's fact it's a story okay it is however teaching the principle of sowing and reaping clearly right you reap what you sow it says very clearly here in verse 20 Five. But Abraham replied to the, the rich man, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. And now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. We do reap what we sow. That's a universal truth. Just like gravity is. If I drop this, gravity says it's going to fall, right? That's whether I'm a Christian or not. I'm going to reap what I sow whether I'm a Christian or not. And that's what Jesus is teaching in this parable. And that's in life and in eternity. And, and you might think of some people like, really? Because I know people that are really mean and really cruel, and they're getting away with it. In fact, they're climbing the charts, so to speak. They're, they're not only getting away with it, but they're prospering. God sees them, even if their boss doesn't see them, even if their coworkers don't see them. It's not up to you. Stop looking at them anyway. Just look at yourself. What we ultimately reap is irreversible. When we finally, eternity starts when we know God, by the way, but when we finally get to, to the other side of eternity, um, in, in heaven or hell, it's irreversible. What we have finally reaped 
is irreversible. There's no going back. The rich man wanted to go back, but he couldn't. So it's also teaching us to, be sensi- to have sensitivity towards other people. I'm sure that the, the rich man, if he had to do it over, would have had compassion on the beggar. Right? That was begging. Now you might think, maybe he was so consumed with his, his money and his riches and his feast that was before him, maybe he never even paid attention to Lazarus. Maybe he never even heard his pleas. Maybe there was so much gaiety and laughter and music going on that he never heard his pleas for for crumbs to fall from his table. Maybe it was more his, his servants and stuff that could have heard. He sure knew his name in hell when he asked for Lazarus to come and dip his finger. He knew. He knew his name. And the moral of the, of the story, of the parable, was that he did know. He was held accountable, as we will be too. And finally, what does this teach? It teaches Lazarus, whom God helps, that we are Lazarus, or we're the rich man. And it has nothing to do with our finances. It could be something else. It could be something else that we're trusting in. We're either Lazarus or we're the rich man. If we're Lazarus, it's whom God helps. It's that we're relying on him. And that we are truly poor in spirit. We're full of sores. We're begging for crumbs. And maybe... Like him, I'm sure, he's like, how long is this going to go on? How long until the rich man drops some or gives in to my plea? But eventually, we're going to be at Abraham's bosom. We're going to be at Christ's bosom. We're going to be in heaven. Eternity, again, is, starts with knowing God. And how does he help? The resurrection from the dead. The very thing that he says, even if there was resurrection from the dead, they wouldn't notice, I'm paraphrasing. He made sure that he would help us by sending his son Sending an extension of himself, in fact, sending himself to die for us and then to resurrect from the dead to help us. That's how he pulled Lazarus's, like you and I, up so that we would have new life. So he didn't just give us money, he didn't just give us food, much more than crumbs. He didn't just heal our sores. He gave us new life. So that's what this parable is really about. Is new life. It's about God helping us. Will you stand with me? I'd like to ask Ricky and Lee to go ahead and get ready. If I could have Pastor Robert come back to the piano. We're going to celebrate new life. That's exactly what water baptism is, is resurrection. It's new life. But I want to give everyone here an opportunity for new life yourself. So if you'd just bow your heads with me. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the promise of new life. Thank you for a glimpse of eternity. Lord, for a glimpse of what heaven is and what hell is. But we don't know everything. Lord, even if you gave us intricate details, a roadmap of what heaven looks like and and what hell looks like, we still wouldn't know everything. But God, just knowing you is enough. Lord, I pray that 
If you have spoken to any person here this morning, Lord, if you've tugged on their spirit, if you've, if you've tapped on their heart, Lord, they need to get right with you. Lord, if they have not been relying on you, Lord, if they've been relying on anything else other than you, Lord, they need to get their hearts right with you. Lord, I pray that they would make that choice this morning. In Jesus' name. If that's you, why don't you just raise your hand? Thank you for that hand. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? Okay. Lord, I pray with the person that raised their hand, and I pray for anyone else who hasn't or anybody who's, who's online that is raising their hand right now. Lord, I pray that you would be the Lord of their lives, Lord. God, not just a get out of hell free card, not just save me from my sins, as important as that is, Lord, but take over my life. Free me from the bondage of sin, but also free me from the power of sin. Lord, I no longer want to be corrupted by slavery of sin. I no longer want to be in charge of my own life. Lord, free me. Lord, show me what true salvation is. In Jesus' name, give me new life. Give me resurrection life. In Jesus' name.